I'm from a tiny town called Burnt Ranch, way up in Trinity County, California. It's a real secluded place, surrounded by the Shasta Trinity National Forest. My family's lived up that way for generations, ever since my great-grandparents settled there as homesteaders back in the 1920s. We had this big old ranch house on about 40 acres of land, mostly forest and meadows. My dad worked as a lumberjack, and my mom was a waitress at the Lone Diner in town. Simple life, but I loved growing up so close to nature. From the time I was little, my parents taught me and my two brothers how to really appreciate the outdoors. Hunting, fishing, camping, you name it. Some of my earliest memories are wandering through the woods around our property, turning over logs looking for critters, building forts with fallen branches. Being out in that wilderness was like a second home to me, which is why what happened to me in the summer of 1997 is so hard for me to make sense of. See, every year my dad would take us deep into the national forest for an annual camping trip, just him and his three boys roughing it in the real backwoods stuff. Truthfully, looking back now as an adult, those trips were probably his way of keeping us connected to our frontier roots. In 97, I had just turned 16, and my brothers were 13 and 11. We drove up this old deserted fire road until we reached this gorgeous alpine meadow full of wildflowers and a creek running through the middle. Perfect isolated camping spot that my dad had been taking us to for years. As soon as we arrived, me and my brothers quickly set up the tents and got a fire going while dad wandered off to scout the area. First couple days were standard, fishing in the creek, shooting our 22s at tin cans, grabbing firewood. Just good old boys being guys out in nature. On the third night though, that's when things started getting bizarre. It was probably around 3 a.m. and I had been awake for a while, laying in my tent listening to the forest sounds, owls hooting, leaves rustling in the breeze, so peaceful and serene, until I started hearing these other sounds, like, I don't know how to describe it, sort of a grunting mixed with a high-pitched wheezing maybe. At first I just dismissed it, but the noises kept getting louder and weirder, almost like there were multiple sources. That's when I heard the unmistakable sound of large footsteps, something huge walking upright and heading straight towards our camp. I was frozen stiff, hardly daring to breathe, when suddenly this putrid, nauseating stench penetrated the tent. Imagine the worst rotten garbage you can think of, then mix it with sewers and burn piles and let it all fester in the hot sun for weeks. That's the foul odor that hit me, so strong it made my eyes water. To this day, I wonder how anything could produce a stench so vile. At that point, I didn't know whether to scream and wake my dad and brothers, or just bury myself in my sleeping bag. Before I could decide, I heard heavy breathing right outside my tent, followed by a snorting sound that chilled me to my core. The breathing was loud and labored, like it was coming from something absolutely massive struggling for air. That's when I saw the silhouette, limbs, and a hunched figure clearly outlined against the bright moonlight, just lingering outside my tent. Now being 16 at the time, I'd been told a million scary campfire stories about Bigfoot and skunk apes and all kinds of other legends, but none of that could have prepared me for what I saw and heard and smelled that night. After those lumbering footsteps slowly faded away, I stayed frozen in my tent for what felt like hours. My heart was pounding out of my chest and I could hardly breathe from the overwhelming stench lingering all around me. I was absolutely terrified to make a sound or move a muscle. Finally, I heard my dad's voice calling out from his tent in a harsh whisper, Boys, you awake? You okay? Did you hear that? I waited for either of my brothers to respond, but there was just dead silence. Slowly and carefully, I unzipped my tent and peered out. The forest looked completely still and normal in the moonlight like nothing had happened, but the putrid odor still hung heavily in the air. I looked over at my dad's tent and saw him poking his head out too, his face pale and confused. We locked eyes and I could tell he had sensed something too. He motioned for me to wait there as he grabbed his rifle and flashlight. Moving slowly and deliberately, my dad started sweeping the area with the beam of his light, inspecting the ground around our campsite. 
That's when I saw what had caught his attention. A trail of huge footprints pressed deep into the soil, each easily over 16 inches long. The prints looked humanoid in shape, but with distinct claw marks at the toes. As my dad tracked the footprints, I saw them leading directly from the thick tree line straight towards my tent, before abruptly turning and heading back into the forest. That's when I noticed the broken branches and matted vegetation, like some massive creature had been there, lingering just outside my tent. I felt dizzy and nauseous seeing the physical evidence of, I still don't know what. My dad started following the footprint trail away from our camp, signaling for me to wake up my brothers and pack up our gear quickly and quietly. We broke down the tents at record speed, throwing everything haphazardly into the truck bed, our hands shaking uncontrollably the entire time. By the time my dad got back to us, we were a frantic, nervous wreck. All he said was, don't ask questions, we're leaving now and I'll explain later. And with that, he peeled out of that meadow like his life depended on it, leaving behind only burned rubber and the putrid stench hanging in the air. The drive back home was spent in total silence. Me and my brothers huddled together on the truck bed, watching the forest gradually thin out into civilization. My dad had this hard thousand yard stare like he'd just been through hell and back. When we got home, he told us to go straight inside while he unloaded our gear alone. It wasn't until a few days later that I was finally able to coax some details out of him about what he had seen that made him evacuate us so abruptly. His voice got all shaky as he described following the footprint trail deeper into the woods, spying massive piles of animal carcasses and bones, just piled up like a barbarian's buffet. He said the footprints eventually led him to a dead end at the trunk of an uprooted tree. The ground all matted down like something huge had been nesting or bedding down there. But the most chilling thing was the tufts of thick, blackish hair he found snagged on the tree bark. Hair so coarse and wiry, it stood on end as if charged with static electricity. From the way my dad described those nest-like impressions and that disgusting fecal stench, whatever we encountered out there wasn't any creature known to man. After that, he refused to take us camping anywhere even remotely near those woods again. I think a part of him always wondered if we'd gotten too close to the lair of something we were never meant to cross paths with. To this day, I've never shared those details with anyone besides close family. Most people immediately write it off as a bear or elk roaming too close. But anyone familiar with the backcountry knows damn well that none of those animals could account for the overwhelming size and stench of whatever paid us a visit that night. Let's just say that I'm happy it's long over and happy to be alive. On the evening of June 17th, 2022, David Thompson was nearing the end of a 12 hour shift as a park ranger at Blackwater Falls State Park in West Virginia. At 54 years old, with over 25 years of experience patrolling the park's trails, David was as comfortable as anyone along the park's trails. But nothing could have prepared him for the bizarre situation he found himself in that night. It was around 9 p.m. when David began making his final rounds on the Pendleton Point Overlook Trail before closing up for the night. This moderately difficult two-mile loop offered hikers stunning vistas of the park's famous waterfalls after a fairly strenuous uphill portion. David had patrolled this trail hundreds of times before and knew every twist, turn, and viewpoint like the back of his hand. As he made his way along the well-trodden dirt path, his flashlight beam illuminating the way, David noticed something peculiar up ahead. A large, lumpy mass was lying directly on the trail. His first thought was that it might be a dead animal that had wandered onto the path, perhaps a deer or bear. As he drew closer, exercising the usual caution around potential wildlife encounters, David realized this was definitely no ordinary animal. The form was roughly the size of a full-grown black bear, but had an unmistakably reptilian appearance. Its body was covered in thick, rigid scales of a dull, greenish-gray color. The creature's head ended in an elongated snout filled with multiple rows of razor-sharp teeth 
that reminded David of the jaws of an ancient dinosaur fossil he had once seen. Two bony ridges protruded from just above the eyes, running along the top of the skull towards the neck. The sight was like something straight out of a prehistoric nature documentary. Gripping his flashlight tightly and radioing in his location to the other rangers on duty, David slowly circled the motionless creature to get a better look. Its body rose and fell slightly with a wheezing, ragged breath. Whatever this thing was, it was still alive. Aside from the faint breathing, it showed no other signs of movement or consciousness. David noticed the creature's eyes were closed, and it seemed to be in some kind of hibernation or coma-like state. Within 15 minutes, two other rangers, Bill Walters and Terry McCallum, had arrived on the scene. They quickly surveyed the situation with wide eyes and dropped jaws. In their combined 40 years of service, neither had ever encountered anything even remotely resembling this strange reptilian beast. What in the hell is that thing? Bill muttered, shining his own flashlight on the creature. The three rangers maintained a safe distance, poking and prodding the creature's scaly hide with some nearby sturdy branches to gauge any potential reaction. Despite their efforts, it remained completely motionless and unresponsive. Looks like it's out cold, whatever it is, Terry observed. But we can't just leave it lying here on the trail, like roadkill. After briefly weighing their options, the rangers agreed their best course of action was to attempt to capture and contain the creature for transferring to a secure location until they could figure out what to do next. David radioed for additional park staff to assist, while Bill and Terry headed back to the nearby maintenance facility to grab some equipment and a crate. By the time the other staff arrived about 30 minutes later, Bill and Terry had returned straining under the weight of the large metal crate mounted on a wheeled dolly. It was a cumbersome piece of equipment, but they hoped it would be sturdy enough to safely contain this mysterious creature. The rangers continued to examine the creature, but it remained unresponsive, and they were ultimately able to get it into the crate and hauled out of the woods. For weeks, the creature was the subject of intense scrutiny, but according to park rangers, all news of the creature was kept from the public. Experts debated its origins and classification. Some believed it to be a new species of reptile, while others thought it might be a surviving relic from the prehistoric era. Sadly, the creature never regained consciousness and died a few days after it was found, or at least, that's the information that filtered its way back to the park. Many believe it to be untrue and that the creature is still alive somewhere, most likely in a government lab or other testing facility. According to the unofficial information, DNA analysis was said to be inconclusive and scientists were unable to determine how the creature fit into the evolutionary tree. The discovery of the creature at Blackwater Falls State Park remains a somewhat of a secret as it's only really known to insiders who experience the encounter. To this day, it basically remains a complete mystery, a scientific anomaly that may never be explained. I was raised in a small town tucked away in the dense forests of rural Idaho. In this area of the state, Juicy rumors could fly through the community faster than the wildfires ripped through the dry trees. While my family seemed relatively normal on the surface, we were considered a bit weird by the locals. In our town, my grandmother stood out the most. She had these intense eyes that made you feel like she could see straight into your soul. Granny used to tell me bizarre tales about the old ones when I was just a little kid. According to her ancient folklore, the old ones were strange, mysterious beings that had lived unseen among the evergreens and rolling hills surrounding our isolated village for centuries, maybe even thousands of years. She described them as vaguely human-like, but grotesquely twisted, more like walking trees than anything human, with gnarled limbs, leathery skin, glowing eyes, and no discernible faces. These strange horrors silently roamed under cover of night watching from the shadows, yet never showing themselves. Of course, I always assumed Granny's old ones were merely exaggerated stories, 
until that fateful summer when I experienced something that still haunts my nightmares to this day. It was the night before my 16th birthday, and a group of us rowdy teenage knuckleheads decided to test our courage by sneaking off into the woods on the outskirts of town. Our goal, to explore the mine shaft, an infamous abandoned mine tunnel that had terrified our parents' generation with stories of cave-ins, evil entities, and those who wandered too far in, never emerging. Being idiot kids filled with an overabundance of youthful boldness, we laughed off the old legends as we crept along towards the mine's gaping opening. The entrance itself was totally unremarkable. A humble five-foot hole in the ground, framed by rotting wood that was being slowly claimed by vines and roots. One by one, we descended the rickety ladder into the depths, our laughter and overconfident jokes swallowed by the underground silence. The dull beams of our flashlights could barely penetrate ten feet ahead, casting a weak glow that seemed to be absorbed by the blackness. An eerie sense of dread crept up my spine as our footfalls hit the dirty floor. The further we entered the haunting depths, Following the twisting path of that old mine, the heavier the oppressive air became. What had started as a fun-filled night of teenage rebellion quickly turned into nerve-wracking tension. Our nervous laughter and chatter gradually petered out into uncomfortable silence. Broken only by the occasional plink of condensation, drip drip dripping from the jagged ceiling. At some point, I realized that I had drifted towards the back of our line, my beam now the last light. And that is when a disturbing phenomenon began to unfold before my eyes. Less than 20 feet ahead, the beams of my friend's flashlight seemed to be getting swallowed by an oily, slick darkness that no man-made construction could recreate. It was as if the very air itself had thickened into a murkiness that was blocking my vision. This wasn't just fear of the dark or being stuck underground. This was the deepest, most profound dread I've ever experienced. A total certainty that some evil presence was ahead, awakened by our foolish trespassing. My mouth became bone dry, my palms sweated profusely. Every shallow, ragged breath was a struggle for air that never quite filled my lungs. I wanted to scream at my idiot friends to turn back, to run as far and fast from this unholy place as our legs could carry us. But the words died in my throat. Then, without warning, the flashlights began to fail one by one, as the darkness rolled in completely. We were plunged into total blackness, and we huddled together. That was when I saw them, two glowing pools of amber light, hovering at least seven feet off the ground, boring into my soul like liquid hellfire. They almost seemed to pulse with a faint, irregular beat. A deep rumbling like an earthquake came next. It raised the hackles on the back of my neck and caused the darkness to darken even more, if that was even possible. In the blinding blackness, my mind raced with horrifying visions of the monstrosity lurking just out of sight. I remember my mouth hanging open in a voiceless scream, my limbs paralyzed. My friends must have caught sight of the eyes as well, as their cries of terror reached a deafening crescendo. That sound, more than anything, finally spurred my leaden legs into action as I whipped around and bolted. I ran as I've never run before, my frozen fingers fumbling desperately against the rough stone walls for any hint of guidance as to how to get out. I could sense it lumbering behind us, an ever-shifting impression of a towering shape that seemed to twist and writhe with every thunderous footfall. Its bellows were like poison daggers piercing my eardrums as we scrambled, frantic to escape. I was partially, eyes wide, but registering nothing in the pitch blackness. I smacked into solid rock walls at stomach-churning speeds, yet somehow remained upright. Finally, far ahead, I glimpsed a flickering light, the promised sanctuary of the entrance. Just when I thought my burning legs would give out, we emerged through that opening and into the moonless night. We kept running, snapping branches and brambles were slashing our exposed skin until we had reached the familiarity of our quiet neighborhood streets, gasping and wheezing in terror. We never spoke of that night. Some unspoken childhood pack kept the terrifying events witnessed in the pits of the ancient mine shaft tightly guarded. I still feel the icy tendrils of sheer dread grip my heart whenever I reminisce on those piercing amber eyes, 
burning from the abyssal murk. To this day, I refuse to venture too far into those forests that harbored the otherworldly entity we disturbed. While I can scarcely recall the twisted details, I know deep in my bones that we witnessed something far more profound, more ancient and horrible than any words can convey. It was December of 2014, and I was working at a water treatment facility the year after graduating high school. Growing up in a small town in Georgia, there really weren't a lot of options if I didn't want to go to college or have a really long commute to a job that wouldn't even pay more. I knew it was only going to be a temporary thing until I figured out what I wanted to do with my life. The job itself was pretty easy, although it was mind-numbingly boring at times. I basically just sat at a desk with six monitors in front of me, looking for anything unusual, anything or anyone that could disrupt or contaminate the water reservoir. I almost always worked the night shift, which was okay with me because I was a night owl, and I liked the peace and quiet of being there at night with fewer people. It was a cool night in December, around midnight, which was about an hour after I started my shift. The only other person I had seen at work that night was Joe. Joe was a nice older guy who worked on the inspection and maintenance of the equipment. We had talked a little bit about the upcoming company Christmas party, which would really be just a lot of guys drinking way too much and being even more annoying than they usually were at work. Joe was trying to convince me to come to the party anyway. As one of only four or five women who worked there, I had already decided I was not going to this party. I was going to be leaving that job anyway after Christmas to start classes at community college. I was ready to get out of this town, and that was the first step. So I was browsing through a catalog of college courses, looking at the monitors periodically. There was usually nothing to see, except the occasional animal that would squeeze its way through the fence. That night was different. First, I thought I saw movement, but the image looked kind of fuzzy. The cameras we used weren't the highest quality, and sometimes images faded in and out. I assumed it was probably Joe, doing a walking inspection, but then when it got closer to the camera and I could see the image clearly, I screamed. It looked like a dog's head, but it was not a dog. Whatever it was, it was way too big to be a dog, and it was standing on two legs with long arms hanging at its side. It was so big and muscular that the body almost looked like a gorilla. I ran to the door, and just as I started to open it, Joe came running toward me. He looked terrified and was going so fast he almost knocked me down. As soon as we got inside, Joe locked the door. I asked him what was out there, but he didn't say a word. He just stared out the windows at the top of the door. The creature walked slowly past us. That's when I realized just how big it was, probably eight or nine feet tall. Joe and I didn't say anything at first. We just stared at the animal or whatever it was. Just then it turned and ran, easily scaling the 10-foot barbed wire fence without slowing down. I remember thinking I must be dreaming and trying to wake up, but it wasn't a dream. Joe and I were finally able to talk a few minutes later. We thought we must have seen a werewolf. Not that the idea of a werewolf walking around made us feel any better. We immediately started searching the internet to see if we could find anything to explain what we had seen. We finally found some pictures and descriptions that seemed to match what we had seen. There's no proof of what happened, and we didn't tell anyone else at first because we knew no one would believe us without proof. We thought there would be a video recording of it and asked the supervisor the next day. But as it turns out, the cameras recorded over the tape every 12 hours, so we never got the proof. I left that job the next week and moved out of that town a couple of years later. Joe worked at the facility until he retired last year. Joe and I have kept in touch and even if no one else believes us, we know what we saw that night. It was 100% a dog man. Last summer I had gone to a family reunion in Lake Tahoe for a weekend. And because I was really enjoying catching up with everyone, I ended up getting on the road really late to drive back home. I do live in Nevada, but east of Tahoe, in a town called Fallon. It's about an hour and a half drive from Tahoe. I had to drive home that night because I had to be back for work the next day, which totally stunk. 
The drive was along Highway 50, which is known as the loneliest road in America. It goes through a lot of desolate desert area and can be boring to say the least. I had been driving about 45 minutes and I was starting to get really tired. I felt this sleepiness coming on and I could tell it was going to be really hard to fight it. I don't know if you've heard of micro sleep, but sometimes you can fall asleep for like 30 seconds at a time and you don't even know you've been asleep. It's obviously really dangerous if it happens while you're driving. It used to happen to me more often than I care to admit because I was working two jobs and was always totally sleep deprived. I tried playing loud music and sticking my head out the window. I tried just yelling at myself over and over, but my brain wasn't having it and I felt as drowsy as if I'd been drugged. I knew I needed to take a break, but I didn't feel safe just pulling over right on the side of the road. I finally came to this old dirt road that headed off to the right, so I turned and drove to this little stand of bushes and tried to conceal my car a bit. I don't even know why I was so paranoid, but I felt like I'd attract unwanted attention from the few other cars I'd been passing. I looked at the clock and saw that it was 11.33, and then I fell asleep. A while later, this scratching sound partially woke me up. It was like a metallic sound like something was scratching at the car. I looked at the clock and it was 12.07. The sound stopped after a few seconds and I was still half asleep so I didn't even really look around and just went back to sleep. I was later awakened by the same sound and it was 12.57. This time it started worrying me because the sound didn't stop. The thought ran across my mind that it was just an animal inspecting the car. But why would it come back almost an hour after it had left the previous time? I was trying to wake up all the way, but that weird drugged feeling was still with me. Then the inside of my head felt like it started vibrating really loud. It was almost painful, but not quite. And then it turned into a high-pitched ring that was about the loudest sound I'd heard in my life. I opened my window and was hit with a strong smell of sulfur. For some reason, I thought that meant I was near a hot spring or something. The scratching had stopped by then. I turned on my headlights and in front of my car, I saw a small group of strange humanoid creatures. They were about four feet tall. They were standing in a triangular shape, and the one in front was slightly taller than the others. The ringing in my head was making me feel like I couldn't think straight. The taller one stepped forward and stared into my eyes. It had black eyes. Everything about them was black. Black pupils, black retinas, the part that should be white, was black. The skin on the face seemed almost bumpy. But while I was watching it, it seemed to become almost plastic and glossy looking. The creatures were sort of holographic and bluish gray in color, and they were able to fade in and out of visibility. It looked like steam or mist was rising from them. I immediately got goosebumps all over the back of my neck and arms. It was steadily gazing at me, and the stare seemed to go on for days. I felt like all the knowledge I had in me was being sucked out. Like my whole consciousness was being red. Then, all of a sudden, I was blinded by a flash of light. Like someone had taken a picture of me with a really bright flash. And then I felt completely drained. I had no energy. My soul felt hollow. And the beings were no longer in front of me. I looked in my rearview mirror and just managed to catch a glimpse of something running away behind me. It actually seemed more like figures made of light were drifting away behind my car. I fully expected to see some kind of spaceship or something, but there was nothing like that around as far as I could see. At least I finally felt completely awake and thought to myself, I have to get the hell out of here. I started the car and got back to the road, and as I headed east again, I saw that the sun was starting to rise. I looked at my clock and saw that it was almost 6 a.m. I had lost about five hours since I had last checked my clock. For months, I questioned my sanity and reality. I knew I couldn't tell anyone, but when I found your channel, I felt like I had to say something, and it's just a real relief to be able to speak about this to someone. I've heard about some strange things happening out in the desert, and I think I've seen some strange lights in the sky out there and whatnot, but what happened to me that night was really up close and personal. I will never feel the same again. Like most guys, spooky campfire stories were about as believable to me as unicorns in your backyard. So, 
creatures lurking in the Ramapo Mountains in New York. Well, that was about as likely as finding a winning lottery ticket. But that's my friend Mark for you, my best friend since kindergarten. He is the resident champion of the weird. So, when our annual camping trip rolled around and the Ramapo Mountains became our destination, he started up again with his creature warnings. The Ramapos weren't exactly the postcard perfect mountains you see in brochures. Think more overgrown hills choked with scrawny pines and forgotten back roads. The kind that make you wonder where exactly they lead. Perfect for a no-nonsense guy's weekend, though. We set up camp around dusk, the air thick with the smoky tang of wood smoke and the relentless mosquitoes. Mark kept glancing nervously over his shoulder, muttering under his breath about hairy things with a taste for human flesh. I laughed it off, but a sense of unease started to burrow in my gut as I had to keep listening to it. The first night was a breeze, the usual campfire routine of roasting marshmallows until our fingers turned black, swatting at mosquitoes and sharing old stories. Sleep came easy, but the second night, that's when things started to feel weird. It was subtle at first, a twig snapping in the stillness when there wasn't a breath of wind, a rustle in the leaves that sent shivers down your spine, even though you knew it was just the sounds of the forest, that unsettling feeling of being watched, the one that makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand on end and forces you to turn around, even though you know there's nothing there. Then came the howls, deep sounds that seemed to claw their way out of the earth itself. The first one jolted us awake, coyotes, we told ourselves, trying to act brave. But these howls were different. They weren't the sharp, barking calls we were used to. Eventually, every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig, had us reaching for our flashlights, scanning the darkness with wide eyes that seemed permanently glued open. Mark, the human foghorn during every past camping trip, was eerily quiet. His face, usually radiating mischief, was pale and drawn. Around 3 a.m., I woke up with a gasp so sharp it could have woken the dead. Then I heard it. Footsteps. Heavy, uneven footfalls that seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere at once. They weren't the light, quick steps of a deer. These were deliberate, slow, and methodical, like a predator stalking its prey. Panic surged through me. I grabbed Mark's arm, my grip tight enough to leave fingerprints. Did you hear that? I rasped my voice barely a whisper. He mumbled something about sleep talking, but his eyes snapped open. But then the footsteps stopped. For a terrifying moment, the only sound was our ragged breathing. Then came the growl, a low sound that vibrated through the air. It originated from deep within the woods, impossibly close. We spun around, hearts hammering against our ribs, and there it was. Standing at the edge of the tree line, Bathed in the faint moonlight filtering through the leaves was a creature unlike anything I'd ever seen. It was tall, easily ten feet high if not more, with a gaunt skeletal frame. Its skin, if you could call it that, was a sickly pale gray, stretched taut over its bones. Muscle definition rippled beneath the surface, but it looked more like the musculature of a starving beast than a powerful predator. Its head was long and narrow with a gaping mouth filled with rows of jagged teeth that gleamed an unnatural white in the moonlight. The creature let out a low growl, a sound that vibrated through the ground, and it took a single lumbering step towards us. That's when I knew. This wasn't a bear, a wolf, or anything else I'd ever encountered in the woods. This was pure nightmare fuel, a creature straight out of legend, and it really looked like it was hungry. Time seemed to stretch and distort in that moment, as I seemed to watch the whole thing happen from above. Every minute felt like an eternity. Then, as abruptly as it started, everything stopped. The footsteps, gone. The growling, horrifying creature, also gone. We sat there just waiting for something else to happen while we scanned the forest. But the silence continued, and the creature never revealed itself again. Slowly, ever so slowly, the fear began to lift. We looked at each other, faces pale and drawn. No words were needed. We both knew what the other was thinking. Get out of here. Packing up camp became a frantic endeavor. The marshmallows, forgotten over the fire, 
were left to turn into black blobs. The tent went down in a flurry of tangled poles. We didn't bother arguing about who forgot what, or whose turn it was to clean up. There was a single-minded purpose to our actions. Get the heck out of there. The drive back was a blur. Neither of us spoke much. The encounter hung heavy in the air between us, a shared experience that defied easy explanation. Every creak and groan of the car seemed amplified. Every rustle of leaves outside the window sent shivers down my spine. We reached the highway just as the sun was starting to climb higher in the sky. Pulling into a gas station, the sight of other people, the normalcy of it all, felt like a lifeline thrown to a drowning man. We grabbed lukewarm coffee and stale donuts. As we sat there, the fear slowly began to recede, replaced by a dull ache of exhaustion and a nagging curiosity. What was it that we had encountered in the woods? A bear, a large coyote. The logical part of my brain tried to latch on to those explanations, but I really thought it was something else. We never went back to the Ramapo Mountains. The memory of that night, the growls, the feeling of being watched. Eventually I came to think that it was a Wendigo, the monstrous creature of Algonquin folklore. But then again, maybe it was something else entirely. I wish I had the answers. Even now, years later, I sometimes wake up in the dead of night, the memory of that encounter jolting me awake. I can still hear the low growl echoing in the darkness, and I can still feel the cold grip of fear that paralyzed me that night. The Ramapo Mountains may not be the most majestic mountain range, but they hold a different kind of power now, a power that chills me to the bone. It's a power that reminds me that sometimes, the things that go bump in the night are all too real. It was a regular Thursday evening in late October when park ranger Will Jameson started his usual patrol through the thick forests of Pisgah National Forest near Asheville, North Carolina. The cool autumn air smelled like decaying leaves and damp soil as the sun went down behind the trees, making long shadows across the winding dirt roads. Will had been a ranger in these woods for over 10 years, and he knew the land and animals very well. He had seen almost every species that lived in this forest, or so he thought. As his truck drove slowly along the secluded path, his headlights showed small animals like raccoons, rabbits, and others running away from the bright light. It was a peaceful scene that Will was used to. However, around 9.15 p.m., something strange caught his eye. Up ahead, in the middle of the road, stood a massive, upright figure, unlike anything Will had ever seen before. At first, it looked like some kind of bear, but as he got closer, he realized this was no ordinary animal. The creature was easily seven feet tall, standing on two powerful legs. Its broad, barrel-shaped body was covered in thick, shaggy, dark fur that seemed to absorb the little light around it. When Will's headlights shone on it, he could see the distinct outline of a wolf-like head with a protruding snout, pointed ears, and a set of massive jaws lined with jagged, dagger-like teeth. Will's heart started racing as he took in the sheer size and imposing presence of this bizarre beast. He had seen pictures and heard stories of the legendary Bigfoot, but had always thought they were just made-up tales. Yet here, in real life, stood a creature that seemed to defy all logic. Gripping the steering wheel tightly, Will carefully stopped the truck, leaving a safe distance between himself and the unknown entity. For several moments, there was an eerie silence as man and beast looked at each other, without moving. Then, without warning, the creature turned its head toward the truck, and Will found himself looking into a pair of glowing, reddish eyes that seemed to bore into his very soul. A chill went through his body as the beast's lips peeled back, and a deep, terrifying sound erupted from its lungs. The sound was primal and earth-shaking. It echoed through the trees and seemed to silence every other living thing in the area. Will's hands trembled as the deafening roar assaulted his ears and he instinctively slammed on the brakes, as if the sudden movement could somehow protect him from the beast's thunderous cry. For what felt like a long time, the creature stood its ground, its crimson eyes fixed on Will, 
its jaws open in a display of sheer dominance and power. Will found himself paralyzed, unable to look away from the otherworldly sight before him. Then, as suddenly as it had begun, the roaring stopped, and the creature seemed to lose interest. With surprising agility that defied its massive frame, it turned and bounded off the road, disappearing into the dense foliage with incredible speed, leaving only a trail of broken branches and disturbed leaves in its wake. Will sat in stunned silence, his heart pounding wildly in his chest, his hands still gripping the steering wheel tightly. He replayed the encounter in his mind, trying to make sense of what he had just witnessed. But no logical explanation could account for the sheer impossibility of the creature's existence. After several minutes, he regained enough composure to radio his supervisor, his voice trembling slightly as he recounted the harrowing details of the sighting. He described the beast's immense size, its wolf-like features, and the way its glowing eyes had seemed to pierce straight through him. Most chillingly, he recalled the earth-shattering roar that had frozen him in place a sound he knew he would never be able to forget. As expected, his supervisor was skeptical, suggesting that perhaps Will had encountered a particularly large bear or some other undocumented species of wildlife. But Will was adamant. He knew every creature that roamed these woods, and this was something entirely different, something that defied all conventional knowledge and understanding. Over the next few days, Will and a team of rangers thoroughly searched the area where the sighting had occurred, looking for any trace of the creature's existence. They examined the ground for footprints, droppings, or any other evidence that such a massive beast had passed through, but found nothing out of the ordinary. The woods remained eerily silent, as if the forest itself was holding its breath, hiding some ancient secret within its densely woven branches. Try as they might, the rangers could find no logical explanation for Will's encounter leaving them with more questions than answers. What was this bizarre, wolf-like creature that had roamed the night-cloaked paths of Pisgah National Forest? Where did it come from, and where did it disappear to after that fateful encounter? And perhaps most unsettling of all, was it still out there, lurking in the shadows, watching and waiting? The mystery remained unsolved, with only Will's unwavering account as proof that something truly supernatural had occurred that autumn night in the North Carolina wilderness. The rugged old logger named Jake took a long pull from his flask as the small group around the campfire leaned in eagerly. He had been training them over the past week on proper logging practices in the area, and they had been camping while training. His calloused hands trembled slightly as he began sharing with them a horrifying tale that had haunted him for years. They had been eager to hear it. It was just another routine day out in the woods at first. Jake started in a low, raspy voice. We'd been running the same grind for weeks, rolling into the lot before sunrise, firing up the roaring chainsaws, surveying the timber plots marked for clearing, looking for the biggest, healthiest, most profitable trees to harvest. He paused furrowing his bushy gray brows as if replaying the vivid memories. There's a kind of rhythm to the work when you've been doing it for decades like me and the crew had. A satisfying cadence to the chopping and sawing that gets under your skin after a while. You get in a groove, letting the tools do their dances with the timber. The heavy thunk of the axe as the keen edge bites into the bark. Jake clenched his jaw, feeling phantom sensations of the impact in his hands. The whining scream of the chainsaw's serrated teeth as they gradually chewed deeper into the trunk. He raised his arms, miming the pulling motions required to operate the saw. Then finally, if you've picked your tree and marked your lines with care, a faraway look came over Jake's face. The mighty trunk gives way and tumbles down with a crash that shakes the whole forest floor. He dropped his arms, slumping slightly to explain the feeling. We'd all bellow out timber! like a bunch of idiots when we first started the job. At least, that's how it was. The smile disappeared as Jake shuddered, taking another steadying pull from the flask, until that godforsaken day. Around the flickering flames, the small crowd remained engrossed, hanging on Jake's every word. 
a young woman in the group finally spoke up. What happened? She asked in a hushed tone. Jake closed his eyes, dredging up the memories he'd tried to repress for so long, and started up again. It had already been a long morning slog. We'd put in some serious hacking and hauling at one of our older cutting sites, clearing out the last value before moving on. Then it was time to traipse what felt like miles through the sea of stumps and sawdust to get to the next section farther up the mountain. I decided to go ahead and start scoring one of the bigger trees to get a jump on things, while the rest of the crew took a breather. After chopping out a few good whacks with the axe to start the undercut, I heard this sound. Jake's eyes opened again, dark and haunted. This low, guttural growling unlike any forest animal I'd ever heard before. He looked around at the disbelieving looks on some of the campers' faces. Listen, I know how it sounds, but I'm telling you, it was bigger than any bear. Deeper and more aware somehow. More sentient, you know, like the snarl of something that could think and decide. Jake rubbed a calloused hand across his whiskered chin. At first, I figured maybe Cooter or one of the other jackass loggers was trying to prank me while I had my back turned, playing some dumb joke, making grotesque noises to psych me out. But then I turned around, and they were all still down the hill, way off in the distance past those scraggly pines. Jake jabbed a thumb over his shoulder, pointing out into the inky darkness beyond the small ring of firelight. That's when I saw it. The old logger took a shaky breath fresh beads of sweat appearing on his brow as the memories flooded back. It was huge, standing on two legs like a man but triple the size, covered head to toe in this coarse, matted, dark fur. But this wasn't any goofy costume or guy in a monkey suit, neither. Jake slowly shook his grizzled head in wonder. This thing looked powerful enough to snap me like a twig without even trying. All wiry muscle and sinew, not an ounce of excess weight, like a Sasquatch or Bigfoot from the stories, but meaner, scarier. The small audience remained deathly silent, scarcely breathing as Jake wove his terrifying tale. One young boy's eyes were as wide as saucers, a look of pure childhood fear and fascination on his face. That's when it opened its mouth. Jake mimed the motion with his burly hands, and it let out this shrieking, ear-piercing roar loud enough to stop a rhino in its tracks. It had row after row of jagged yellow fangs, as long as my fingers, all glistening with saliva. He shuddered violently at the recollection. I am not ashamed to admit that I just about filled my drawers right then and there. If you'd been in my boots that day, you'd have soiled yourselves too. Around the campfire, a few nervous chuckles escaped from the small crowd, quickly silenced by Jake's expression hardening again into grim recollections of the encounter. But here's the part that stuck with me deeper than any of the rest. Burrowed down into my bones like a souvenir from hell itself. Jake leaned forward, his voice lowering to a gravelly rasp as he continued. To the thing's right was one of those stunted, gnarled hardwood trees growing at an angle. You know the type. Tough as steel, dense as a diamond. Our imported chainsaw blades would dull after chewing on those damn things for just an hour or so. I figured if it came at me, that crooked trunk might at least slow the beast down a bit if I had to try to make a break for it. Jake fell silent for a long moment, the campers barely making a sound as they waited with bated breath. But then, the old logger raised a trembling hand, placing it on his whiskered cheek as if feeling phantom pains in his jaw. Then this, whatever the hell sort of monster it was casually reached over and wrapped those massive, leathery gray hands around that solid hardwood trunk. Jake mimed gripping an invisible tree trunk, his gnarled hands clenching tightly as the corded muscles in his thick forearms strained, and with one smooth, deliberate pulling motion, it just snapped the whole six-inch piece of petrified wood clean in half. A collective gasp escaped from the small audience. The young boy shook his head rapidly eyes bulging in disbelief. No gnawing, no sawing, no struggle, Jake affirmed, a dead seriousness in his voice. It just calmly broke that hunk of timber with brute force, like it was a damned twig in the hands of a child, the sickening crack of the wood exploding. It was like a thunderclap right next to my head. 
He lowered his hand, leaning back again with eyes closed as the cadence of his words slowed. I felt it sever something inside me in that moment, a piece of my soul fracturing clear off from the sheer shock and awe of witnessing that phenomenal strength. Jake opened his eyes again, and they were haunted, a million yards away. After that display of power over something so unyielding, my legs finally worked and I just turned and ran. I ran until I thought my lungs would burst from exhaustion, hardly looking where I was putting my feet. Didn't bother letting the crew know, didn't stop to grab my gear. I just hightailed it out of those damn woods and never looked back. Jake shook his head slowly, the dying firelight dancing across the crease lines in his face. Whatever the hell that thing was, it sure as shooting wasn't any cuddly Bigfoot creature from childhood stories. There was an ancient, primal malice and lethal intelligence burning behind those slitted eyes. The old man's voice grew soft, nearly a whisper as he concluded his tale. And a raw strength, an earth-shattering power. Jake fell silent again, letting the weight of his recollection hang heavy in the chill night air. The small crowd remained transfixed, no one daring to break the stillness. Finally, the young woman spoke up again, her voice barely above a whisper. So, what did you do after that? Did you report it to the authorities or... The old logger shook his head, beard swaying gently. Report what exactly? That I'd had an encounter with a mythical creature, a beast out of legend. Who in their right mind would have believed that crazy tale? He snorted derisively. No. I just hightailed it back to my truck and burned rubber getting the hell out of those woods as fast as I could. Didn't even stop to let the guys know I was leaving for the day. Just ran, flat out. Reaching into his tattered jacket, Jake pulled out an old Ziploc baggie containing some strands of coarse, dark fur. He upended it over his calloused hand, letting the small clump of foreign fur spill out. This is all I took with me as proof. All that was left behind when whatever it was, decided to let me flee with my life. The young boy's eyes went wide again as Jake extended his hand for all to inspect the strange fur sample up close. A few of the campers leaned in, running their fingers over the thick, matted strands. Have it examined by every so-called expert and wildlife lab I could find, Jake continued. But they all came back with the same damned confused conclusion, unknown origin no species match. He snapped his hand back, making a tight fist around the fur, as if worried it might blow away in the night breeze. So you just never went back to that forest, never tried to investigate further. The young woman seemed dumbfounded by the idea. Hell no, Jake barked out a bitter laugh that was closer to a growl. I walked away from that logging crew, that life, those woods, without a second's hesitation. Washougal National Forest can go rot for all I care nowadays. His expression turned cold and distant once more. Whatever that thing was, there ain't no way it was just some peaceful, dumb forest creature. There was an ancient malice and cunning behind those eyes that could seduce the blood in your veins to ice over. As Jake clenched his furry fist again, a few campers swore they could see his forearm muscles tense and shape as if unconsciously recalling the power in that simple snapping motion. And that strength, that earth-shattering power to just reach out and shatter something so dense and sturdy with ease? Jake shook his grizzled head, staring deep into the dying campfire embers. I ain't never going back into those damned woods again, no matter what anyone claims to have seen or how much they's paying. I already got an up-close and personal look at the devil himself and I'll be counting my blessings if I never have to lay eyes on him again the rest of my days. With that, the old logger stuffed the fur sample back into his jacket and slowly rose from his creaking log seat, knees popping. As he grabbed his weathered walking stick and turned to head off into the night, the young boy couldn't resist one last question. You keep calling it it or the thing, but you never said what you think it was, Bigfoot or something else. Jake stopped for just a moment, half turned back toward the dying firelight. The orange glow cast flickering shadows across the craggy terrain of his ancient face. I'm an old man who's lived his life in these woods, and I've seen just about every creature this green hell has to offer over the years, 
he said in a low rumble. But I ain't never seen anything else that walked like a man, yet had the power to reduce one of nature's toughest creations to kindling. He turned away again, hunched shoulders adding a final inscrutable shrug as he drifted off into the dying night. It's no Bigfoot, that's for damn sure. Whatever it is, it's something else entirely. Something much worse. With that ominous parting warning, the old woodsman's weathered form was swallowed by the enveloping black tree line, leaving the rattled campers to stare after him in uneasy silence. This story takes place in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, in October of 2011. The experience I'm about to share is one of the most memorable experiences I have ever had, for better or worse. However, I am never 100% sure how to describe in words what happened because it was just so strange. But I guess I'll just start at the beginning. It was fall, and I was driving home from work late on a Friday in October of 2011. I was coming my usual route home. That night, there was next to no traffic on the roads, and thank goodness the sun was starting to go down low enough that it wasn't really blinding me anymore. But the street lights hadn't turned on yet either, so the light was sort of strange. I was down near the entrance of the shopping center, and I saw a woman walking along on the sidewalk ahead of me. She was the only pedestrian out there. She looked like she was maybe in her mid-40s and had long brown hair. I watched as she stepped off the sidewalk and went onto the grass next to it. She had a small dog with her that she looked to be taking on a walk. As I got closer to her, I stopped at a stop sign. That's when she quickly turned left and changed her direction completely, turning towards my car to cross the road in front of me. When she passed in front of my car, we made eye contact, and that's when I saw what looked like fear in her eyes. I don't know if there was just something weird or unsettling about her appearance, but she looked like she had seen a ghost. And not only that, but it looked like she was afraid of me as we looked at each other. I say that because she flinched backwards a bit as our eyes met. It didn't last very long, maybe two seconds at most, but there was definitely some kind of weird energy exchanged between us as we passed each other by. And right after that is when things started happening. As soon as she passed my car, I started to hear a dog barking from further down the road behind me. Obviously, I've heard barking dogs before, so it didn't seem too strange at first. But as soon as I heard that dog bark, the dog she was walking started barking frantically and tugging and pulling at the leash. It was such a crazy reaction that the woman could barely contain her dog. I watched her as her dog continued to go crazy, barking and pulling her back towards where they had just come from. She was definitely losing control of her little dog and I wondered what was going on because I could hear the other barking get closer and closer and louder and louder. When I turned around to look, what I saw nearly gave me a heart attack. There was this dog that was running at her like it had gone crazy or something. I say crazy because it was running towards her and her dog on its two hind legs. I thought it was a dog at first, but as I looked closer, I saw that it wasn't a normal dog at all. It kind of reminded me of a werewolf at first. If you can imagine a dog with pointy ears and eyes like a lizard or something, it definitely didn't look natural, and it scared the crap out of me. No, definitely not natural looking. Its legs were longer than a dog's, like a weird proportion, and it stood straight up on its hind legs like a man would. It had long, silvery, dark-colored fur that covered parts of its body face, so I couldn't really see all of it. It's hard to describe it exactly, but you can take my word for it. This was a dogman. The dogman had a dog-like head face. I also definitely saw canine teeth and claws like a dog would have. Only they were way longer than any dog I've ever seen. It was instantly obvious that her little dog was trying to get to this thing, and that's why it was pulling her along. Had she already met up with this creature? Is that why she had that crazy look on her face when our eyes met? Like, had it already come after her once before? I'm not sure if I was seeing things or imagining some of this, because it all happened so fast, but there's something else I want to tell you about before I forget. The last thing that really got my attention was this dog man's eyes. It looked like its eyes were glowing red in color, and I'm not talking about raccoon eye glow here. They were bright red and had a look to them that said, you will die. 
Pure evil is the only way I can describe it. So, I sat there watching this encounter as the woman's small dog was pulling towards this creature that was running at them. I could hear the creature growling and hissing this crazy noise, and it was getting closer to them by the second. Now I can't tell you how much time passed while this was happening, but it didn't feel like very long at all. I kept wondering what in the world is going on here. Is this weird creature wanting to kill this small dog and woman? And if so, why hadn't it already done it? I mean, I was sitting right there in my car, and it hadn't even looked at me. And then, I watched as it stopped its assault, and just stood there. It was watching the dog and woman, but it wasn't coming after them anymore. I think somehow, the dog and woman both realized that the danger had stopped, and the woman now picked up her dog and headed away. At this point, her small dog was so worked up, probably from both fear and anger, that he continued to bark growl even as they walked away from it. And then, I looked back at the creature, and it too was now retreating. And it wasn't long before it disappeared out of my sight completely. I just shook my head in disbelief at what I had just witnessed. But after all of that happened, I sat there in my car scared to death about what I had just seen. I guess I'll never know what it was all about, and if that woman had encountered that thing before. It sure seemed that way to me, but all I can do is speculate. Either way, it was an experience that I'll never forget for as long as I live.